welcome. My name is Mario Vitale, and this is Molto Mario. I'm here with my good friends H, Annie, and Anthony, all dressed in black, as it were, today. And we're talking about the exquisite cooking of Sicily, more specifically, the trattorias of Siracusa. We're going to make a simple grilled mackerel with some marinated eggplant. We're going to do some baked ziti with cauliflower, and then a winter squash in what they call the style of fegato finto. It's like a fake liver. It's got nothing to do with liver at all. It's just this really cool dish. The most important thing to realize is that it's very simple food. Anybody can make this stuff, and it's even more exemplified in the Sicilian cookery because it's just that much more simple and that much more ingredient driven and the ingredients are that much closer to kind of what we have a lot of access to. If you've ever been to Sicily, there's tons of citrus and there's tons of wheat. It was considered the granary for the Greek and Roman cultures. And if you're familiar with Sicilian history, as I cut my eggplant, we'll talk a little bit about it. First were the Greeks, then were the Romans, then were the Franks, then were the Goths, then were the Saracens or the Arabs followed by the Spaniards. And each one of those cultures left an imprint on the cuisine and the agriculture and the style of life that really is what made Sicily this beautiful melting pot with tremendous flavorings that are really, really different compared to Italy. When you think about Sicilian cooking, you should be thinking that it's a lot closer to Morocco and Tunisia than it is to Milan and Venice. So the flavors are that much about the Northern African stuff and there are some really interesting things going on these are some of those very dishes. We're going to take some beautiful eggplant and we're going to score them after cutting them in half. You can get these long purple ones, you can get the regular black ones, you can get the little small ones. It doesn't really make a difference. The most important thing is if you have your opportunity, choose one that's a little bit younger as opposed to a little bit older. That is to say smaller as opposed to larger. Because once they get to a certain size, they have large seed pockets. And the seed pockets, you can see just little thin ones here. The seed pockets are what, in my opinion, carry a little bit of that bitterness. But they're also just a little more grainy, grainy to chew on. So if you can do the ones without as large a seed pocket, what you'll get is something that's just a little bit more creamy, a little bit more unctuous, and really what we're looking for. So what we're going to do here Mario, is score them, yes? Is there a difference? Of, uh, you just talked about the taste or the seeds, but is there a big difference in the taste between the different types of Not eggplant? that radical. It really is more about the presentation. They're still all, when properly treated, they're all still kind of creamy and they're still kind of delicious, and they really are also a very good palate on which you can paint other flavors. Okay. They really take other flavors really well. It's not that predominant of a flavor when they're just left alone. I'm I'm going to take a little bit of dried oregano here, and I'm going to actually toast it in this hot saute pan. What I'm going to do is pinch it, and you can see it starts to smoke a little bit. This is the way you're going to be able to add a lot of flavor. One of the most important things that I could tell anybody about cooking around the house is go home, look at your spice cabinet, and dump the whole thing out. Because the garam masala has been there since you made curry in ninth grade, and it hasn't changed a thing, and it's not getting any better, believe me. It's less fragrant and less important. Now we've got that toasted oregano. I'm going to add about a half cup or a quarter cup of red wine vinegar. I'm going to add some olive oil, about 50-50 in this case. This is kind of like a marinade that would just as well be a salad dressing. And I'm going to add a little bit of cayenne, maybe about a teaspoon. That's going to give us a lot of chili action. And I'm just going to toss these in there with no salt whatsoever. If I were to add salt at this point in a marinade factor, what would happen is it would start to exude its liquids. And then when you put it on the grill, those liquids are going to kind of stick to the grill. We want it not to happen like that. So I'm just going to dress them like so. And then get them, oops, get them right on the grill. After they're done cooking, I'm going to take them off, I'm going to season them, and I'm going to resubmerge them in this marinade. And then what that'll do is just allow you to put it back in the fridge if you want, or you can just serve it room temperature as it were. But they would also stay quite well for a couple of days in the fridge. And make just like a great little empty pasta. Now one of the things about today's meal is we're making something, we're really only making one real course. This could be an empty pasta, the first course, or a main course. Then there's the pasta, which is the real course. The last dish is actually a contorno dish that could either be served as a main course on a light day, in the winter when you've had enough to eat and you really don't feel like having that much more, your third course is just going to be a little bit of vegetables and that's very much a part of the Sicilian cooking as well. Now, now I've got some mackerel. Mackerel is a fish that bothers a lot of people. It's one of the blue-fleshed fish, that is to say one that's really high in the omega-3s, very healthy, oily fish, really good for you, lowers your cholesterol, the whole thing. A lot of people have a little problem with it. It's very much like blue fish, like we get here on the East Coast. Any kind of oily fish that you can find is going to substitute well for this. If you can't, however, find anything like that, the main event in good fish cookery is always going to be the freshness of the fish. So even if it was a trout or a wild striped bass or a wild salmon or local whatever is going to be better than anything you have to ship from a long ways. And that's really the main point about understanding Italian cooking is that the substitutions of ingredients are what's really going to drive your boat to feel and taste more Italian, even if you're using ingredients that aren't necessarily Italian. 
which is what we kind of try to do at all of my restaurants. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to brush those with oil. I'm not brushing the grill with oil. I'm just brushing the fillets with oil. And I'm going to lay them on the hottest part of the grill. Mario. Yes. Are those the same fish you use for the bruschetta, alaska, and mackerel? Yes, as a matter of fact, well, we use them, they're already cooked. We buy canned mackerel, uh -huh. like canned sardines scombro, or canned scombro. and it's gombro. It's gombro. Exactly. And they're delicious. It's just got a really great flavor. The main event to a good grill is making sure that when you put something down on the grill, that you'll let it sit there. Because if you start to try to move it around and try to look like you're the big grill master, what'll happen is you'll end up leaving the skin there. And that's all right if you don't want to taste the skin, but I think the skin's one of the best parts. So I'm just going to let it sit there, and then we're going to make the salsa verde. Before we get into that, though, I'm going to drop some cauliflower in the water because we're going to make cauliflower al forno, pasta gratinata with cauliflower al forno. And we want to make sure that we get it nice and tender. We're not all about al dente vegetables here. We're about cooking them all the way through. And I'm putting it in the same water that I'm going to cook the pasta in because that's going to add another layer of flavor for our pasta. Now, with the eggplant and mackerel, we're going to make something called salsa verde. And you'll have heard about this and see it all over Italy in different regions and different styles. They use it a lot in the bolito misto in Bologna. They use it a lot in, uh, in grilled meats in Tuscany. And it's a very simple sauce to make. All you have to do is understand that you have to buy good things. We're going to use a salted anchovy that I've rinsed. We're going to use about two tablespoons of salted capers that I've rinsed and soaked for four hours. We're going to take about a nice size handful of parsley and a nice size handful of mint, yes? Why do you soak the capers? Because they come packed in salt and they're inedibly salty when you get them. Oh. They taste a lot better if you buy them salt packed than if you buy them packed in the brine. When you buy the ones that are packed in the brine, which are the ones that we're used to, those are the ones that taste more like a pickle. The actual caper itself is the flower of this shrub that hasn't opened up yet. It's just a bud. So when they, if you think about them, they're very, very delicate. And when you salt pack them, you get a heck of a lot more flavor of the actual thing. Now, in making the salsa verde, I've pureed that, and I'm going to add a couple of ingredients. When we come back, I'll show you how we finish off the salsa verde, and then we'll also get down and get funky with our cauliflower and pasta al forno. Now the cauliflower is cooked. This isn't any fancy al dente cauliflower. It's cooked cauliflower that's cooked all the way through. I'm going to add a little bit more salt and I'm going to immediately dump my ziti right in the water so that we can make our beautiful baked ziti with cauliflower. That's about a pound and a half. That should serve three or four of my friends or probably eight or nine real Italians as an appetizer. Mario? Yes? If you wanted to add some color to the pasta, in addition to the cauliflower, what would you do? Would you add? You haven't even seen the dish. I know, this is going to be a really colorful dish. Hold on there, lady. Sure? Oh, absolutely. You watch. You watch. <laughs> All right, now, the next thing I'm going to do is finish off my salsa verde. I'm going to take some of the zest of this lemon and just peel it off with a knife. You can use a peeler. You can use a fancy zester. You don't need to, though. And then what you want to do is just chop it up really roughly, like so. First of all, one way. And then second of all, the other way. And what you want to do is just toss it right in there. This is something that's going to be relatively quick and painless. We're going to take an egg and we're just going to chop it up just like so. And this doesn't have to look too fancy. You want it to look kind of like what it is. The egg, you're going to see when you taste this, is what really makes this whole dish so good. You could easily make it, though, however, if you had a cholesterol issue, make it without any egg at all. And it would just not have any egg in it. It would be fine. It just wouldn't be as fun. And then we're going to stir that through. And that's the salsa verde. Now, we've taken our eggplant off. We've thrown it back in the marinade. We're going to take our mackerel like so. And notice how the skin has come perfectly crisp. That's because I literally cooked it 75 to 80% of the time on the skin side down. Then we take our little marinated eggplant guys and just pile them up haphazardly. You don't want it to look like the French got a hold of this. You want it to look real simple. And then you just serve it like so 
with the salsa verde, kind of drizzled over each one. Hello, Sicily. <laughs> now, if you could go ahead and serve that up for me, guys. You'll need a little bit of a, a spoon will help you. A piece of everything for everybody. Mario? Yes. How do you keep the fish from, other than just putting olive oil on it, keep it from sticking on the grill? Just the the whole trick is to make sure that you brush it with a little oil. You have a very clean grill that you don't have to oil that. You just clean it really well. You put it down and you just leave it there. The, the tendency is to say, oop, oop, got to move it, got to move it. I watched right. it on TV. I move it around. The real thing, the real way it works is just leaving it there and allowing it to cook. The skin will eventually pull away because as the protein coagulates and starts uh -huh. to tighten, which is what cooking is really uh -huh. all about, it'll pull away from the griddle because it wants to maintain its own integrity. So that's the whole trick. That's it's really right, quite simple. It's just make sure you have a hot enough grill and make sure that you have the tools right next to it and don't be afraid to change it so quickly. Just let it go. Now, we're going to start cooking our cauliflower again to create this beautiful pasta al forno. How is that? Mm. Is that creamy eggplant or is it creamy eggplant? It's very yummy. There you go. I was hoping that. So I'm going to take about six cloves of garlic, which is quite a bit, and this dish is quite garlicky, and we're going to just saute them like we normally do, cut thin, Wow. and we're going to allow that to just lightly toast with a touch of chili flakes, and then I'm going to take an infusion of saffron, and quite frankly, this is where we're going to get our color from. I'm going to take this about a teaspoon of saffron. I'm going to mm -hmm. stir up my pasta water and take just a little bit of it because it's nice and starchy. And I'm going to put it in there and I'm going to create kind of like a saffron tea. And this is the way that I'm going to infuse that beautiful saffron flavor and allow it to become more pervasive much more quickly. I could easily sprinkle the saffron in here, but when it goes straight into oil or fat, it doesn't tend to cook and give such a strong flavor. And I want it to be really all over the place. Then I'm going to take my cauliflower and toss it in there. Now, when I put it in the pan, if I hadn't broken it up, it's not going to be an issue. I'll just reach in here with the knife. And what I want to do is kind of brown the cauliflower here. This is, again, where we're going to get a little bit more of the color component. And I'm going to season the cauliflower now with a little bit of salt and a little bit of pepper. And we're going to toss it like that. Now, when you're making baked pasta dishes, you cook your pasta even less than you would in the normal way. When we talk about how I always treat pasta, I always cook the pasta about one minute less, then I take it out and I put it in the pan and I cook it with the sauce. But this is now going to even go in the oven for another half hour. So I'm going to pull it out even earlier. And the way you're going to know that is by taking a poke at it. And you just want it to make sure that it's still crunchy. That's still just a bit too crunchy. So I'm going to let that go and we're going to finish our cauliflower. And the way we're going to do that is add just a little bit of chili flakes. And then I'm going to add three beautiful anchovies, and I'm going to chop those up and toss them in. Now, again, these are the salted anchovies that I've rinsed. Whenever you buy any of these gems from Sicily, when you talk about Sicilian cooking, you talk about citrus, you talk about their capers, and you talk about their anchovies. Everything comes salted except for the citrus, and you always just want to rinse it off and allow it to go. We're going to toast in some pine nuts. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, if you don't have any fresh anchovies, could you use anchovy paste or something like yeah, that? Yeah, anchovy paste is an acceptable substitute, okay. but this is the best way to go. I'm going to add that saffron. And now we're just about ready. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take out the ziti and I'm going to pour it well drained into my pot or into my gratin dish, my oven ready dish. And I want to go like that, and then, while that's still very, very hot, I'm going to dress the pasta with about half the cheese and stir it around. Now, right now, you could probably enjoy this quite well, but that's not enough for us. <laughs> so now I'm going to take all that beautiful cauliflower, right? Now we're starting to moan a little bit. And we're going to stir that through very nicely. And then I'm going to take the rest of that cheese, and this is probably a cup of cheese in total, I'm going to take that, and I'm going to coat that with a good amount of this. And this is kind of like a festival dish, obviously. We're going to take a little bit of breadcrumbs, say a cup, and then to make sure that it gets all nice and fun and juicy, we're going to add just a little bit of extra virgin olive oil, and then we're going to put it in a relatively slow oven for me. I generally tend to cook things hot. This is going to go in like a 375 degree oven for about 30 minutes, in which case then it's going to come out beautifully gratinati. When we come back, more about Siracusa and their beautiful trattorias, and we'll finish up with a beautiful dish of winter squash. So please, stay with us.
welcome back. I'm here with my good friends H, Annie, and Anthony. And we're talking about the beautiful cooking of Sidakuza. We just finished a magnificent appetizer of grilled mackerel. We've got our pasta with cauliflower baking. And now I've got my winter squash called Hubbard squash. And we're going to make this kind of in an agro dolce, kind of a sweet and sour. The main trick is to understand that there's thousands of different kinds of squashes, but the main idea is to understand that you can treat them all pretty much similarly, and what you'll find is the delicate variation in killer flavors, and that's what I love about these winter squash. First of all, they're very satisfying to eat, and second of all, they're very simple to cook. You just take out the seeds like so, make sure you get all that skin off because it's about as edible as tooth enamel, and then you wanna make sure you just cut it into little pieces, so you can make it quite simple to cook. Now this could just as easily be an antipasto as I said before, or a light snack to serve with a piece of cheese as your main course at a lunch. So you got a light snack, you got main course, you got side dishes, you got the whole thing. Mario, and, yes. what would you do if you couldn't find this kind of squash? I've never you seen this You could substitute before. any of them. You really? could substitute small pumpkins, acorn squash, butternut squash, whatever. There's so many squashes available right now in America, particularly in November, December, January, February. Yeah. It's absolutely incredible. It's mind-boggling. So now, the trick is, season it well. Salt and pepper, plenty of it. And the real tray is once you get it in the pan, to leave it alone because we want to take it to the caramelization. Caramelization, if you're not familiar with it, is just about allowing things to have their natural sugars and starch come forward through the introduction of heat and some kind of a lipid here like this olive oil. And the tendency again, just like in that mackerel, would be to quickly start moving this around like you're sauteing like one of the big shot TV chefs when in fact you should just leave it right there. Now, what we're going to do differently with this, in Sicily they love to eat a little bit of liver every now and then. There's not a huge amount of animals. They don't have that many pigs. They certainly have some cattle. They make this beautiful scamorza cheese from it. When they have calves liver, they saute it and they serve it in the Saracen style, which is with garlic and either sugar or honey and a little bit of vinegar. We're doing that exact same thing here and that's referred to as agro dolce or sweet and sour. The main event is to make sure that you cut your garlic and then add it at the very last minute because you don't want it to get too brown, but you want it to become part of the flavor component. We're gonna sprinkle a little cinnamon here and really make it taste nearly Moroccan. If you're familiar with the bistilla, the Moroccan pigeon pie with the filo dough, the main, of, the main seasoning in that is actually the cinnamon. So I'm gonna sprinkle the cinnamon over that right now. Mario. Yes. Do you find a lot of uh, cinnamon in Sicilian cooking? Yes. There's what, what I consider the, the cookie spices, cinnamon, cloves, and nutmeg. You find those a lot in Sicilian cooking, and that is really kind of a reference or an obvious fact of showing that there's a lot of that northern African flavors. The Arabic cooking uses a lot of sugar, uses a lot of the cookie spices in mo many of their savory dishes, and that's really how they discovered sugar. Sugar was introduced to Sicily by the Saracens in the 800s or 900s, and it was uh, cane sugar. And then ever since then, they've developed one of the most amazing and renowned sweet tooths, as well as palates for understanding how to make great desserts. And you know, they make marzipan and all those crazy desserts. So now we've got this going, and we're gonna add just a little bit of parsley to this mix. And then we're gonna start to take a look at these guys and see how they've gotten a nice little caramelization. Now to finish that, it's gonna be very simple. See, that's the most important thing, that you've allowed it to cook through there so you get some nice color. And that's gonna give you a lot of depth of flavor. Now to finish that, we're just gonna flip them all over. Then I'm gonna sprinkle the oil with sugar, say about a half a cup and allow that to just start to caramelize around the squash itself. And I'm going to add a little bit more pepper, and I'm going to add a little bit of red wine vinegar. What's going to happen is that's going to melt into kind of what's called the gastrique, this kind of sweet and sour vinegar syrupy stuff. When we come back, I'll show you how we're going to plate this whole thing up. We'll get our pasta out of the oven, and we'll have a Sicilian feast just like in Siracusa. So please, stay with us. Welcome back. Well, now we've got our beautiful pasta gratinato coming out. It's nicely charred over there on the top. The way to finish that is with a little bit more of the cacio. It's going wild. The cacio cavallo is breaking up. Everybody grab yourself a little antipasto there. A piece of that cheese as it falls. 
This is there. yours. That's yours. Mm -hmm. There you go. Mm -hmm. And then, to yeah, finish yeah. off our squash, I'm going to add just another touch of that Saracen influence. We've got our sweet and sour going on there. Now we're going to take at the very last minute a couple of mint leaves. And mint leaves are easy to find. This, I believe, is spearmint. Peppermint's a little more aggressive than you want. We're looking for that spearmint flavor, which gives you that kind of interesting sweetness and that Kentucky Derby feel. You know what I mean? You ever been to the Kentucky Derby, Anthony? No, no. Not that's really where they not. drink mint juleps. Anyway, that's got nothing to do with this. All right. We're going to take just a little bit of this mint and give it a good chop. Always want to chop your herbs if you're going to splash them over something at the last second, right at the last second, because what happens is they start to release those essential oils and become absolutely delicious. Then we're just going to toss that through like that. At this point, you could add just a little bit more chili flakes if you wanted, but you really don't need to. And there you have Zucca or Hubbard squash and agrodolce. Here's a little bit of pasta. Let's serve it up. Ladies first. And there you have it, a perfect Sicilian meal. Oh, that looks delicious. Finishing up here with our exquisite pasta gratinata con cavolo fiore and our beautiful zucca. I want to thank you guys for being here. You've made it a heck of a lot of fun. I want to thank you guys for being here, and I look forward to seeing you on the next Molto Mario. Ciao. Who wants a little zucca?